Last year in December, I gave an interview at Microsoft. And in the last round of the interview, I was asked this question. What happens when you switch on a computer? Now, before I answer this question, let us spend a minute looking at the internal structure of a hard drive. For the sake of simplicity, I'm assuming that we have just one hard drive attached to our computer. First 512 bytes of a hard drive store something known as MBR or master boot record. MBR contains a table known as partition table that stores the structure of remaining hard drive. The remaining of the hard drive is divided into multiple partitions. For a Windows PC, these partitions are generally named C and D drives. At last, there is a small partition, generally few GBs in size, that is called swap or virtual memory. Swap space is used by computer to store data that would ideally be in RAM, but the RAM may not be big enough. Please note that swap space is actually not available to the user to store data. It is used by computer when it's doing the computation. Now in the partitions that are available for the user to store data, one or more of them may be bootable. That is, they may have a copy of operating system installed on them. In our example, we have just one copy of operating system present in our C drive. But if we were running a dual boot computer, then I might have another copy of operating system installed in another partition. A typical example of this case is when you have a dual boot computer having Windows installed in one partition and Linux installed in another partition. If a partition is bootable, that is, it has a copy of operating system installed on it, then the first 512 bytes of that partition will contain a program known as bootloader. If you are wondering why there is a magic number of 512 bytes both in the case of MBR and bootloader, then we will take up this question in few minutes. For now, we know the internal structure of the hard drive, so let's proceed to answer our original question. When the power on button is pressed, the first chipset that gets activated is called BIOS. BIOS stands for Basic Input Output System and is responsible for three things. First, BIOS performs a power on self-test, also known as POST. In this BIOS verifies if the computer keyboard, RAM, disk drives and other hardware are working correctly or not. If everything is working correctly, it will give you a beep sound as output. If something is wrong, it will give you some other beep sound pattern as output. You can actually use this beep sound pattern to identify the error. I use a gigabyte motherboard which has following beep patterns. One short beep means the system is working normal. One long beep followed by one short beep means RAM is either not working correctly or maybe the RAM is missing. One long beep followed by two short beeps means there is some error with the graphic card and so on. You can actually find beep patterns for your motherboard manufacturer by doing a quick Google search. Next, BIOS looks at the boot sequence to find a storage device and loads the MBR into the RAM. We already know MBR contains a partition table that has entries regarding partitions on your storage device. Now BIOS will look at the partition table and identify all the bootable partitions. If there is just one bootable partition, then BIOS will actually proceed to the boot process, else it will give you an option to select the operating system that you want to boot. When BIOS knows which partition to boot from, it will go to that partition and again load a program stored in first 512 bytes of the selected partition. This is the bootloader. If you are using Linux, then your bootloader will either be Grub or Lilo. In case of Windows, the program is very creatively known as Windows Bootloader. The bootloader is responsible for loading the operating system into the RAM. If you are wondering why BIOS does not load the operating system on its own, but delegates the same task to the bootloader, then the answer is BIOS is a pretty old piece of hardware. It was designed in 1975 and can only access 512 bytes of memory at a time. This is where the magic number of 512 bytes that puts the hard limit on the size of MBR and bootloader comes from. Nowadays, computer hardware manufacturers are moving towards a new implementation of BIOS that is actually known as UEFI, which stands for Unified Extensible Firmware Interface. UEFI can work with both 32-bit and 64-bit machines and provides additional features such as Secure Boot. Secure boot simply means to check the operating system for any kind of data tampering since the last boot. Once the bootloader is copied successfully into the RAM, the BIOS gives the execution control to the bootloader. The bootloader is responsible for loading the first major piece of operating system into the RAM. This is called a kernel. If you are using Linux, then it is called a Linux kernel. On Windows, it is called WNT, which stands for Windows New Technology Kernel. Once the kernel is loaded into the RAM, the execution control is given to it and starts a three-stage process to bring our computer to life. In the first stage, the kernel performs a test known as auto-probing. 
Auto probing simply means to check if other hardware components such as Wi-Fi card, Ethernet card, hard drives, keyboard, mouse, etc. are working correctly or not. Once auto probing is done, the kernel will check if hard drive is okay or not. Traditionally, mechanical hard drives used to be the most fragile part of the whole computer system. But this is no longer the problem with new SSD or solid state devices. Once all the checks are done, in the second stage, the kernel will start the system daemons. Daemons are programs that run in background and provide services to other programs. There are daemons for services such as printer spooling and networking. Once the daemons are running, the kernel will execute the GUI manager or the display manager that will actually give you a login screen. On a typical modern computer, it takes about 10 to 15 seconds to see a login screen after pressing the power on button. During this time, computer actually executes over a million lines of code just to give you a login screen, which is quite magical. In my next video, I'll describe what actually happens when you enter username and password into an operating system and how we can tweak the logic with our understanding to log in into a local machine without having a username or a password. Until next time, goodbye.